you. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And I'm really excited about um, where Tennessee is at in the process of learning the science of early brain development and thinking about how to apply it to everything you're doing in the state for the benefit of children. So what we're going to talk about today, we'll have a little period of time where we just review how experiences shape brain development. But we're going to spend most of the time during this lunch hour mapping a workforce development strategy. That is, how do you take the information you've learned about brain development and put it into action so that people can really use the information and you can change things for child development both at a personal interactive level, one-on-one -on -one with children, but much more importantly, at a societal level. How do we set up communities that have the resources, that know what to do, that are going to make things work for kids? So let's go ahead and get started. Next slide. Okay. We're talking about brain development because as you, I think, are almost all experts on, the brain is the foundation of lifelong health and lifelong well-being, and it's built in early childhood. Next slide. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about resources that we've developed in our Working for Kids Building Skills Educational Program. And you might be wondering, what is she talking about? What is Working for Kids? Well, Working for Kids was a program that we developed here in Pittsburgh and is now being used internationally that takes the education material that neuroscientists, psychologists, pediatricians, social workers have all accumulated over the last decades and puts it into educational forms that are really available for everyday people. Everyday people don't really want to sit down and read textbooks. They want to hear stories. They want to do activities that teach it. They also want to do things like play games and have a fun time learning. And so what Working for Kids really is, it's, it's an educational program that utilizes strategies that are more acceptable to the general public. And the goal is to really provide education about brain development to everybody in the community. And as pictured here, you can see we spend a lot of time trying to educate parents, but we educate public health workers, social workers, teachers, doctors, um, the police force, grandparents. We're really trying to embed children in a community where everybody knows how to help them have sturdy brain development. Next slide. So I'm going to spend a short period of time reviewing what you already know. And I know you know it because I've been interacting with people in Tennessee for the last few years. Um, I see somebody just sent a quick note in the um, uh, notes section over here on this presentation that they're now using the brain architecture game which we developed a number of years ago. So I'm thrilled to see that you're using these things. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about how experiences build brain architecture and how adversity actually impacts brain circuits. But I think this is just a few minute introduction to the topic. We're then going to work our way through um, really the meat of today's discussion which is really thinking about how can Tennessee put into place strategies that work to get this information out to the public. Next slide. Okay, so one thing Working for Kids tries to do is use storytelling. And just to get us all on the same page about how important experiences are, 
I'm going to tell you a story about these two little boys. The little boy on the purple line is Darren, and Darren's mother is a hairdresser. Now, we're going to talk about how Darren learns to talk. What's happening in the first couple years of his life? Well, Darren's mom is a hairdresser, and I don't know about you, but I go to the hairdresser, and my hairdresser, Gary, talks and talks and talks and talks. We have a great time talking together. And um, I asked him at one point, how do you have so much to say to somebody like me, a neuroscientist? Do you do the hair of other people that uh, do neuroscience? And he said, oh, Judy, you're such a nerd. That's not what I do. I just like talking to people. Well, Darren's mom is just the same way. And when Darren is born, she starts talking to him nonstop. She talks to him, tells him how much she loves him, but she points out everything going on. And Darren is embedded in a household where lots of people are talking and lots of people are talking to him. So he pays really particular attention to communication. We expect that he'll start talking at about the age that most children start talking, right about 12 months of age. So you see this line starts at about 12 months. He says his first words, and then he's going to have an increase in vocabulary, but he's going to have a very rapid increase in vocabulary. By the time he's two years old, we would expect him to have about 600 words in his vocabulary. It's a big increase. But you can imagine that every time he says something, his mom is going to give him tons of positive feedback. And as he's introduced to new people, they're going to give him lots of positive feedback. So he gets a lot of positive feedback for talking. Now, his neighbor is Robert, and Robert's on the lower green line. His mom's a dental hygienist. Have you ever had a long conversation with somebody while you're having your teeth cleaned? Probably not. My dental hygienist might say a word or two while she's cleaning my teeth, but I can't answer, of course. My mouth is wide open. I'm having my teeth cleaned. Um, and so she's not as talkative as a person. She does not start talking to Robert when he's born. She um, figures she loves him a lot. She plays with him, but she'll start talking to him when he starts talking. So Robert is embedded in a situation where there isn't anywhere near as much communication going on as in Darren's household and not as much talking right to him going to start talking at about 12 months of age and by the time he's two he'll also have an increase in communication skills but he's expected to have around 150 words in his vocabulary now you might be thinking no big deal Robert and Darren are just two years old they're going to learn tons of words as they get older and you're absolutely right. That is what they're going to do. But these are trajectory lines, and they're actually lines that are based on scientific um, studies that have documented how rapidly do children have an increase in vocabulary. And what we know is that children like Darren will always have a much larger vocabulary and be more comfortable speaking than children like Robert even when they get into a school and even in adulthood. So Robert will learn to speak. He may be very bright at other things. He may be fantastic at history or math or mechanical things. He'll do very well and he'll learn enough words to get along just fine, but he won't be as comfortable speaking. Why is this? Well, this is a really good example of how important experiences are. The experiential difference between Robert and Darren makes a difference and changes how their brains develop. And so the circuits in the brain that control communication 
are going to be much stronger in Darren. Let's take a minute and see how this happens. Next slide. So this is a typical slide that somebody like me, a neuroscientist, just loves. But I think you're going to like it too. It shows you the pattern of connections between brain cells when the brain is developing. In the left-hand panel, you see that you have almost all the brain cells you're ever going to have at the time you're born. So the brain cells have been put in place, but there are not a lot of connections between them. Different parts of the brain develop at different times. And by the time this particular brain area is three years old, there's tons of connections between brain cells. And that's how brain development happens. Brain cells, I'm using my hands and holding them up here to represent brain cells at different times in development. They're programmed to reach out extensions and make connections to each other. And the way this works is they make a huge number of connections. And then connections get pruned back till you have your final neural circuit. So you can see when this brain area is 14 years of age, there were fewer connections, but the connections that are there are really strong and work very well. If we go to the next slide, you can see that there are different times when different areas of the brain are developing. So the upward swing of these lines indicates when connections are being made. The downward swing indicates when pruning is happening. So some of the first pathways to develop are sensory pathways for vision, hearing, taste, making connections prenatally, and pruning is happening mostly during the first year of life. During the pruning period, the more a connection is used, the more likely it is to be strengthened and become permanent. If it's not used very much, then it will get pruned away. So knowing when different brain circuits develop and giving kids experiences to use those brain circuits right at the time they're developing is critical so that they have lots of circuits for each function. Language starts developing before birth, the brain circuits that control language, and is pruned during the first seven or so years of life. So having children have lots of conversations, hear language, use language in the first seven years, build strong circuits for language. And we remember Darren and Robert, and we know that's true. Your cognitive function, when you say you're thinking about something, you mean you're using that front part of your brain and it develops over a much longer period of time. It's developing connections for 11 or 12 years and pruning goes on from 11 or 12 to 25. So experiences from pre-adolescence through early adulthood really matter to strengthen those um, circuits. Okay, how would we explain this to the public? I, this is a lot of information to take in. We can give textbooks. I have no doubt that you in Tennessee have seen lots of videos about this. But what I'm going to do right now is stop sharing the screen and I'm going to use a poster that I have right here. Working for Kids likes to give people hands-on activities to teach them. So we would say some of the first areas in the brain to develop are those that influence sensory function. And I put a picture of the eyes here. This back part of the brain is involved in detecting vision and sending messages to the rest of the brain about what you see. It's developing prenatally, remember? And pruning will happen through the first year of life. 
we have an area right in the middle of the brain here that's involved in making emotions and understanding emotions. It's going to start making connections prenatally and it's going to finish pregnant about five years of age. Now you're going to experience other emotions later in life that you don't have in the first five years of age, but you're going to use those brain circuits that were developed early. So giving children the chance to have emotions and see emotions, understand them is particularly important. Right above that area is an area involved in communication. We have a picture of a mom talking to her son on a telephone. And um, this area develops and makes connections prenatally till about five years of age or till about seven years of age. And up here, we have an area involved in motor function. So big motor functions like walking, running, kicking, and small motor functions like writing and playing a musical instrument starts developing prenatally and finishes developing at about five. So many of these areas have a similar time course of development. And it's very different from the front part of the brain here that's making connections for the first um, 11 or 12 years of life. And then the pruning period when this area is really sensitive to experiences is until about age 25. We give people yarn, a very sophisticated neuroscience material um, to get them to really think about how can they help their kids build strong brain pathways? So let's think about reading. If you're reading something, you need to see the words on the page and connect that to the communication centers of the brain to say the words and understand what they mean. So we want to have children from very early in life um, using these connections that connect these two brain areas. We ask parents to think about what can you do with your child to get them to use these brain pathways. And we make one loop of yarn for every idea they come up with. So lots of parents know that reading to young children is a really good idea. And they'll say, well, I'm going to read books. And I'm there, okay, we'll make one loop. But what else are you going to do to improve reading? And they may say, well, I will have them look at magazines and things in the house that have words on them. Maybe while I'm cooking dinner, they can look at the recipes or they can look at a box of um, a, the macaroni that we're going to cook and read how to do that. Well, that's a great idea. We'll let them make another loop for that. The kids need to use brain pathways thousands and thousands of times to increase the probability that they'll be permanent. So we make them keep thinking of new ideas. Let's say you were driving in the car. Maybe you can point out road signs to your child and have them read the signs or the billboards. What else can you do? Maybe you can have them help you open the mail, even if it's junk mail and read what that says. So we're using a hands-on activity here to get children to really understand and, uh, that they need to use circuits over and over again and to get adults to be more creative in thinking about how do you get children to use those brain circuits enough. They have to use them on average at least about 10,000 times to form a strong permanent brain pathway. Once they do that during the developmental period, they'll have it for the rest of their lives. Now, parents don't always like to hear this, 
that you can develop um, brain pathways that parents really weren't hoping that children would develop. And an example I like to use, I'm going to show you with the red arm. Let's say we have a child growing up in a household with an adult who has trouble controlling their emotions. They get mad all the time. Well, they're going to become experts in recognizing what anger and madness look like. They're going to use this brain area a lot. And most children will get out of the way when they see anger. They'll learn to go to their room. They'll go outside. They'll, at least if they have to stay put, pay attention to something they're reading or something they're working on so that they're removed a bit from the anger. How much do children who face an angry adult in their house see anger? Unfortunately, they see anger a lot. And these brain pathways are forming in the first five years of life. So they're going to build strong brain pathways for recognizing anger and getting out of the way. That may sound really good, but um, you don't always want to get out of the way when people are angry. Let's think about this same child getting old enough to be in middle school and the teacher's mad at them because they didn't turn in their homework. You wouldn't want the child just to get up and leave, but a child who's had these experiences early and has these brain pathways will be more inclined to tune out and leave mentally, if not leave physically um, under that circumstances. What you would like them to do is to rethink the situation and try to understand that the teacher is trying to help them. So I'm going to use orange yarn to show you what happens when you're starting to give the development of these prefrontal pathways. Remember, they're developing in a really strong fashion from birth to 25 years of age, and especially from 11 or 12 to 25. What we would like this child to do is rethink, so reevaluate why the teacher is mad and understand that the teacher is mad because they're trying to change the child's behavior. And they would like the child to inhibit running away and pay good attention and learn to do their homework on time, learn perhaps to communicate more effectively. So these new pathways get built are just as um, influenced by experience as the early pathways, and they can modulate the pathways. If we can share the screen again now. Jen, can we share the screen? Yeah, good. Okay, and next slide. Okay, so we're going to turn and now talk about, okay, we've now learned, and I've given you a very quick review on how experiences shape brain development and how adversity changes what children are doing during early life. And so they build different brain pathways than they had before. But you can see that um, through the orange brain pathways we just built, that it's not the end of things. Children experience adversity, they build different brain pathways, but they're still building brain pathways through the first 25 years, and we can use those to remold how, what the impact of stress is. So what we're going to spend the rest of today talking about is protective interventions to strengthen brain development and enhance resilience. Next slide. So the conceptual framework here, um, go forward, uh, is 
that all of our programs that we put in place are pushing up on the health trajectory go forward. But experiences and adversity push down on the trajectory. Next slide. What we would like to do go forward is put in new preventative interventions go forward so that we are blocking the impact of adversity. And what we're going to talk about next is what are preventative interventions? Next slide. So anything that helps with building brain pathways for these skills, focusing attention, problem solving, planning ahead, behavior regulation, controlling impulses, and ingesting to new circumstances. Collectively, we refer to these as executive function and self-regulation skills. Anything you can do for a child to help them with these skills will help them have resilience. Let's think about how that might work. And Working for Kids has spent a lot of time thinking about this. Next slide. We have started to develop a series of games. And one game I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about is an absolutely free game that is available to all of you. Next slide. This is the first Pathways game. You can access it on your mobile phone. I have a mobile phone right here. If I went to my web browser on my phone and typed in www firstpathwaysgame.com, a screen will come up and ask you if you want to register. You can just put your name in. You can just use your first name. I could use Judy. We don't keep track of who you are. We just want the game to be personalized. So once you've done that, the game will talk to you as Judy. Um, if you pull up the game and it's completely free, you can put in the age of your child, and um, there are eight age brackets from newborn to six years of age. And in fact, we've now just expanded it to seven and eight years of age. It's a game, so there's a wheel for you to spin, and a game comes up. Here's an example of a game for three and four-year-olds. Give your child some pipe cleaners and straws, ask them to make an animal, and then have them build a home for the animal. And then it tells you what brain pathways you're strengthening, fine motor skills, problem solving skills, figuring out what would be the right home for your animal, communication skills, talking about it together. And you get a bonus skill, early science learning. Next slide. These games use regular everyday household materials. There's 250 of them. They are focused on improving brain circuits um, and improving adult-child interactions. All of the games are things that adults can do together with children because we're trying to encourage adult-child interactions. We're not trying to give the child something to do on their own separate from the adult. Um, if we go to the first video, I'm going to show you examples. Uh, I can't hear. Nope. Development children use to both display emotions and recognize emotions of other people are developing in the first years of life. It's important to help children recognize emotions and allow them to show emotions early, but also to reinforce these brain pathways as children get older. Making Faces is a great game for zero to six month old children.
making faces. Make emotional faces with your baby, like smiling, frowning, or pouting. Don't be surprised when they start making some faces and noises back. And when they do, make sure to cheer them on. By practicing showing emotions, you're being emotional social circuits in their brain. For 12 to 18 month old children, one of the first pathways has is called hugs. Children like getting hugs and they love giving hugs too. Have your child hug family members or their or their stuffed animals and count how many hugs they give. Make sure children get hugs back also. Say, I love you during the hugs helps strengthen brain pathways for social emotional skills. Oh, hug and roll. Guess my feelings is a great game for social emotional skills. Guess my feelings. Have your child draw faces with different emotions on them. Ask them to tell you a story about each face and why they're happy or sad. Your child is communication skills, and social-emotional skills. At eight years of age, a good game for strengthening social skills is emotions I feel at school. Have your child describe emotions they feel at school. Different activities. You act out what they're describing and have your child rate your acting. This improves communication of play as well as social and if we could have the next video this one will talk about problem solving children start building brain pathways for problem solving very early in life keep building these pathways all the way to age 25 problem solving encompasses many functions. So it's a good thing that children have a long time to develop all these skills. These skills include learning how to get a task done, learning about doing things in a certain order, decision making, and complex reasoning. From 6 to 12 months is a terrific game. Magic Cereal Show your baby a piece of cereal or in this video and hide it under the cup. Lift up the cup to show the cereal hiding under it. Your baby will use the brain's problem solving pathways to figure out the magic. Soon it will be hard to fool them. Another great game for six to 12 month old children is empty the box. Put objects in a box and let baby take them out. Count out loud as baby takes objects out. This activity strengthens the brain circuits for problem solving, the circuits for communication skills, motor skills, and number skills. To improve motor skills in three to four year olds, a whole series of games on the first pathways game, but one of them is connect. And this is a simple game you can actually do anywhere that you have a pencil or a pen or a crayon and a piece of paper. Draw dots on the paper and then ask the child to connect the dots and have them count the dots as they're making the connections. This strengthens brain pathways for problem solving skills, for fine motor skills, as well as for number skills. Let's see how this works when we're building brain pathways. So you've now put dots on a paper and your child's job is to connect the dots. They're going to use motor pathways and these will be fine motor pathways that allow them to connect from one dot to the other. So the motor pathways are being used but they're going from one dot to the next, so they're using their problem-solving pathways. And as they do that, 
you're getting them to say the number of dots that they're counting and connecting out loud. So they're using communication skills. This is a really fun game. And if your dots actually make a shape or something the child really likes, they're probably going to get pretty excited. And you're going to connect to emotion regulating pathways. Simple game like this that you can play anywhere builds lots of strong pathways in young children. Finding fish is a fun game for six to eight year old children. Tell your child the following story. Robbie has five fishes. If he gave two fishes away to his sister, how many fishes does he have left? Play this game with different numbers or subtraction. Understanding and trying to answer word problems helps strengthen brain pathways for problem solving skills, but also for number skills and communication skills. The first pathways game has games for older children to improve problem solving skills. One example is alphabet throw, which is designed for six to eight year old children. You, the Take six pieces of paper and write a letter on each piece and lay them out in front of the two of you. Then take turns and look at the letter, call out a word that starts with that letter, and take a softball and throw it at that letter. What brain path are you using? Well, you're using problem solving pathways. You're trying to think of a, let a word that starts with that letter. Then once you do that, you are using your vision pathways to take aim at the piece of paper and you're using your motor pathways in order to throw a ball accurately at that paper. That is, you call out the name of the paper, you're using communication skills. And that's what this problem solving part of the brain does. It connects to all the other parts of the brain and it does fine tune regulation. These are the skills that are developing in older and continue to develop until 25 years of age. Science learn. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Problem solving. Oh no. Okay, so the next slide after this. Learning. Next slide after that. Okay, so what we want to do is not only set up situations and give people resources for how individual parents can help their children build strong brain methods, but we want to help communities develop what we call charging stations places in the community that can support families in strengthening children's brain development. And uh, next slide. These same pathways that we've been talking about are um, able to be strengthened and developed um, by community resources. So what we have in this picture, in the center, we have what Working for Kids calls the circle of learning. For a child to learn something, they have to become interested in learning it. They then need to engage their own brain circuits in doing that activity. And lastly, they need to develop self-confidence so that they will do it enough times thousands of times so that they will develop strong permanent brain circuits and they have enough self-confidence to take on harder and harder things to learn. We spend a lot of time teaching adults that the attitudes of adults in the community in black letters, you have words like support and encourage. We have a whole fistful of black letters and we get adults to think about all the attitudes that help children with learning. 
But every environment has some attitudes that work against learning. Now, it's not just the parent or the person that's spending a lot of time with a child. Everybody in the child's environment or community can help the child with learning. And that's what these charging stations represent. There are personal charging stations, kind of like a wall socket. A personal charging station for a child might be their next door neighbor or a grandparent or a caretaker. People that can help with setting up an environment that really encourages learning for the child. The multi outlet um, represents something that's available to many children in the community. So maybe a soccer team or a soccer coach, that's a real charging station. The child can learn how to play a game, can learn how to interact with others. It's not just there for one child, it's there for lots of children. A school teacher could be that resource. People in the church could be that type of resource. So to have strong communities, we need to make use of everybody in the community. And the first Pathways games that you just learned about have versions that can be used for childcare centers and can be used for schools from um, kindergarten through third grade. And if there's interest in using sets of games in those contexts, Working for Kids has those available. Next slide. Now, I want to spend the last few minutes talking about something that may be surprising to you, and that is the important role of healthy sleep. So we've talked about how important um, adult-child interactions are. We've given a lot of resources and tools that are freely available that can be used to strengthen adult-child interactions. But working for Kids is also a research program, and we study um, in this country and in several other countries how children are doing developmentally um, if their parents have the Working for Kids training. And over the last couple of years, we've studied 100 children in Canada and in the US. And I want to show you a little bit of scientific data now to convince you that sleep is way more important than we had previously realized. Next slide. So in um, this Working for Kids study, there were 100 children. They were three to five years of age. We found, really surprisingly, that 60% of the children were not receiving sufficient high quality sleep. These were all kids that were using social service providers. They were making use of family support centers. They were making use of resources that provide um, food, shelter, but also childcare. So they came from a wide variety of social service contexts. We had the parents fill out questionnaires called the Child Sleep Habits Questionnaire. CSHQ stands for Child Sleep Habits Questionnaire. It's a questionnaire that asks the parent about eight different parts of a child's sleep. How um, well do children go to sleep? How do they do when you put them in bed at night? Is there bedtime resistance and they don't want to go to sleep? Do they fall asleep right away? How long do they sleep? Do they wake up in the middle of the night? Do they have parasomnias? Those would be things like nightmares or walking in the night. Do they have sleep anxiety or the things that really worry them? Do they have to have a light on while they're sleeping? Do they have any type of sleep disordered breathing or daytime sleepiness? And what you see here is a frequency chart. It's telling you how many of the 100 kids had scores of 0 to 90, the maximal score. And what you see 
is that 60% of the kids had scores over 40. A score over 40 means you have a sleep problem that is in the clinical range that a doctor would pay attention to. Now, these were not children that had any clinical problems. They were just regular three to five year olds. So we were just flabbergasted when we saw this. Next slide. We started looking at the relationship between the CSHQ score, remember anything over 40 is worrisome, and we're looking at the relationship between other functions that the child does. If you look to the far left, this says GEC, and you probably wonder what that is. It's an executive function major. How well does the child regulate their own um, emotions, their own activities? And you see a really strong relationship. The worse the sleep, the worse the regulation. Okay, so a high G score means you're having a worse time regulating yourself. And so poor sleep, poor regulation. We also looked at communication skills. In this case, high levels are good. Um, high levels of, of communication skills um, are good. Low levels are worse communication. And so you see the line going in the opposite direction. The worse the sleep, the worse the communication skill. And we looked at social emotional skills, regulating emotion. In this case, we saw that the worse the sleep, the worse the regulation. If we go to the next slide, we see the family stress, the impact of family stress on all of these child outcome measures is strongly mediated by sleep. Sleep is very critical. Next slide. And so Working for Kids has now um, developed new educational modules that promote healthy sleep. And we're spending a lot of time talking to people about just how important sleep is and giving people good ideas and stories and activities they can do to get their children to have better sleep. Next slide. So Working for Kids is trying to give you tools that you can use in your community. Next slide. And I put several resources here in the last slide. And I think they're going to make these slides available to you. You can go to the website of Working for Kids. And if you want to have a six hour program where you learn to become somebody that can give Working for Kids training, you can go to WFK at teachable.com. So we hope we've given you ideas and resources that you can use in your community today. I'd be happy to take questions at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Cameron. That was fabulous. And I'm getting so many comments in the chat about how useful these resources are going to be. Um, so if you all want to go to the chat box, um, kind of if you hover over your screen, there should be a little um, a speech bubble. And if you tap that, it'll give you access to the chat feature. Um, and if you want to go ahead and, and put in some questions, I can read them aloud, both for the benefit of Dr. Cameron and for the benefit of people who will be watching this recording from YouTube. Um, a few of you asked while I'm waiting for um, Few of you asked if the, the um, slides would be available. I think that Dr. Cameron just mentioned they would be. Um, so I will be sending those out as a .pdf file um, in addition to your certificate if you attended the live training and the webinar link recording. Great training. Okay, it says, um, where do you begin with a child with limited interaction with parents, but they are already 12 months old? good thing about um, 
interactions and brain development is it goes on a long time. We emphasize all the time that early is really important and early is important. You've already learned today or at least refreshed your memory that lots of circuits start building early. But the good thing is that you're still building brain circuits to 25 years of age. So let's say you didn't develop a skill as well as you wanted. It was a skill that developed early and by not having lots of interactions in the first 12 months of life, you didn't get much utilization of that skill. You can develop other brain pathways that can get you to do that skill. In the end, the baby's brain may not be using the same brain pathways that it would have used if it had started early, but other pathways connect and if they get lots of use, the child can do the activity. So think about problem solving and there are lots and lots of ways to solve a problem. If you don't learn one way, you can learn another way of doing that. Hopefully um, that answers your question. Love it, the brain is plastic. <laughs> um, yeah. Another question is, let's see. As a foster parent, can the brain relearn from early trauma? Which I think you kind of answered in your last question, but you might. Yeah. So you cannot erase brain pathways. I get lots of questions all the time. If a child has had early trauma and they've developed brain pathways to cope with that trauma, I gave you an example with the red yarn on the poster behind me where a child had grown up in a household with a parent who had trouble controlling their anger. So they became really good at detecting anger and they ran away. Once you've formed those pathways and you're kind of past that plastic period, can't erase the pathways. However, I showed you with the orange yarn that you could develop new pathways that would allow the child to adapt to situations where people are angry with them. And instead of running away, they could rethink, why is this person angry? realize that they're trying to help them and using those new pathways that inhibit running away and that allow them to pay extra attention to why the person is mad, they could come up with a new strategy for how to deal with anger that allows them to do something productive. So you adults need to be creative um, in working with children to be able to do skills, but if they faced trauma and developed brain pathways that may not be to their greatest advantage, you may have to be creative and think about what new brain pathways can they develop that would help them have a workaround. So I'm a big believer in the brain developing all sorts of workarounds to allow children to function. Next question. As I work with children and adults, I see some of the training sets being able to be used with seniors with um, Alzheimer's. These are great for all ages. What do you think about that? I love that idea. And <laughs> in fact, in my lab, I'm also a university professor and I do a lot of work for the Aging Institute at the University of Pittsburgh. And we do exactly that. So I think that it also works for all ages. One thing that we are very big into right now is trying to develop community resources for children. And one fantastic community resource is the older individuals in the community, the retired individuals who may have more time than many of the working adults. And so, Getting them to play, for example, the first Pathways games with children in the community helps everybody and gives the parents a break. They don't have to take the time. They're completely um, inundated with things they have to do going to work. 
but the child is still getting one-on-one -on -one attention, interaction, and strengthening brain circuits. I love it. Great example of that um, that surge protector multi-plug <laughs> that you were talking about. <laughs> yes. All right, next question. Where can we get one of those wonderful brain posters? Her demonstration was incredible. Uh, well, they are available at workingforkids.com. They cost you some money, but we try to keep the funds low. We like to sell them to people who've taken the Working for Kids training. And so I put a link uh, that you can look at right now on the slide that's up at wfkteachable.com. If you take that training, it will teach you how to use all the Working for Kids materials. You can then buy the Working for Kids materials and um, go out there and educate people. That's exactly what this is. It's a train the trainer program. We're trying to get these materials and this education out worldwide. Love it. Shameless plug in Tennessee who have gone through that training and they have found it so valuable and useful, particularly with parents and police officers um, and correctional officers that they work with. So great, great stuff. Um, this may be really linked to this um, website that you've listed, but it says, can you provide more information on the six hour training that is available? Yeah, I would go to teachable.com. Perfect. Um, if children have a sleep disorder, how sleep so um, we actually now have two training modules one on healthy sleep and one on healthy exercise and nutrition um, and we um, suggest you take that training module they we've priced them at a very low level so they are hopefully accessible for absolutely everybody because we become real advocates for increasing sleep in children. We have lots and lots of ideas in there for how to work with children with all sorts of issues to get them ready for bed and winding down and getting ready to go to sleep, how to deal with problems like getting them to put their electronic devices away or their phone that they want to be on or turn the TV off. Um, we have uh, good suggestions for what to do when your child wakes up in the middle of the night. Um, we have good suggestions for how to get children not to wake up a number of times in the middle of the night and then want to sleep in in the morning, but how to get them up in the morning so that they develop a good, healthy cycle of sleep where they sleep at night and they're awake during the day. So I strongly suggest that. That's wonderful. And Dr. Cameron, it's two minutes after two more questions. Um, do you have some? Okay, good deal. Good deal. We've got the, <laughs> we've got the way back, so we should be good to go. So um, somebody says this information is very exciting. Our agency will be hosting several workshops with our parents program participants this year. This information in the first path pathways game will be a resource for them and their families. And I just want to echo that I appreciate um, the dual nature of this presentation, that it's both about supporting the workforce that um, is, is helping develop strong brain architecture, but it's also about building the strong brain architecture of the future workforce, right? And so all of the exactly. things that are happening in this early, these earliest years affect um, the, the quality of the workforce that we have 20 years from now. So. Um, uh, another comment, this information is very exciting. Um, and then I have, thanks for the great webinar. Um, here's another question. How do you help a child who is eight or nine years of age become a better reader? I am meeting children in this age range who seem to be on a kindergarten level. So that's a great question because I often talk to adults in all sorts of contexts that say, my child is past the period of time where they're really de developing that particular brain pathway, and yet they need to learn that skill. And so that's where you really want to remember that that front part of the brain, the frontal cortex, is still building brain pathways to age 25. So 
let's say we do have a child who didn't have much experience reading in the first seven, eight years of life. And now you really, as their teacher or as somebody who cares about them, want them to become a much better reader. This is going to be harder because just getting them to read again and again, they are past the plastic period where simple reading will strengthen the pathways needed for reading. You need to get them to pay attention to reading. So you might be thinking, hmm, what does this child really care about? And get them to read something that they are really, really interested in. It's gonna be more important for this child than it was early on. And kids will always read more if they're interested. But for this child, their front part of the brain, the part of the brain that's saying, hmm, I really wanna learn about this, has to be working really hard in order to get them to use those brain pathways that you use for reading. So you wanna pay extra attention. You wanna give them tons of positive feedback so that even if reading is hard for them, even if they're slow, they feel super good about themselves because you're using that front part of the brain and the emotion centers in the brain to help guide them towards more reading. A really important thing to remember here is that what are plastic periods? Is that the only time you develop neural circuits? And the answer is no. So this is real important to pay attention to. All your life, you'll build brain circuits. During a plastic period for a skill, they're building really fast. So I said it takes thousands of repetitions to build circuits in a plastic period. If you're trying to build that same circuit outside the plastic period, it's not that um, doing the activity won't build the circuit, it will. It just takes tens of thousands of times. It takes much more utilization. So you can see that you have to give lots of positive feedback. You have to tailor things to get the child really interested. But the more they do the activity, the stronger their brain circuits will become. And that's true all your life. What a great, honestly, it makes me think back about um, when we were talking the question about traumatized children and just remembering that, you know, it may take a lot more effort on our part and a lot more creativity um, to those sort of productive ways of handling stress. Um, the next one. It's never too late. I mean, the answer should always be, it's never, ever too late. And it's always worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so um, I think you've already answered the first part of this question. Do you have any suggestions on how to encourage good sleep? You recommended that folks go to the um, There's a question about breaking habits at screen time. I, I heard you mention that that was a part of the module. Um, this is a- Oh, I was gonna say, I'll chime in there and say, the number one thing that adults face is getting children away from screens. It, we get inundated at Working for Kids with uh, questions about that. So we have lots and lots of information and ideas about that because it's extremely difficult. Yes, um, this is a question that may not have been answered. It says, is sleep interrupted by a light on while sleeping? It can be, but it isn't always. We advocate that you try to have a situation where children can be um, in a, as quiet of an area as possible, as undisturbed as possible. We are giving advice often to families where many people are sleeping in a single room. And we um, try to advocate that the child be put in a corner of the room or a back part of the room that will be as dark as possible and as undisturbed as possible um, because that will improve their sleep. So just having a light on isn't a problem. What you're trying to do is create the best circumstance you can that the child will have uninterrupted sleep. So 
certainly having the light not go on and off is going to be important having them be in as dim and quiet of an area as possible is going to be important. But we try to work with um, families and groups so that we can teach them what they're trying to achieve and then let them adapt it to what will work for their living situation. Super helpful. And often we get that um, is not tailored to the unique needs and challenges of certain families we work with. So thank you for that. Um, how do you help close the reading gap when they have experienced trauma? So I think one thing you want to do is you want some children who experience trauma, just to kind of put this in context, that it really depends on the individual child and the individual circumstance. So many children that experience trauma in the first years of life are so wrapped up in what they're feeling and trying to avoid the traumatic situation happening again that they aren't as interested in reading. And those are children that will have a negative impact of the trauma on reading. Other children may turn to reading as a way of escaping the reality and they'll read more and more. Now those children may have experienced just as much trauma that was just as painful, but what they chose to do um, changed what brain pathways got used and what brain pathways didn't get used. And they're not going to have a negative repercussion of the trauma on reading pathways. Once you understand that, then what you can do is try to tailor things to an individual child. Maybe you can help them find things to read that will comfort them, that are something they really enjoy, something they feel comfortable reading, something that helps them deal with the trauma. And so that you're encouraging them to turn to reading as a way of dealing with the trauma. That will do two things. It will help them deal with the trauma, but it will strengthen reading skills at the same time. These things need to be really custom tailored by the adults that know the child best and know the child's situation the best and the particular child. So what we are always trying to do is teach people the basic processes by which brain development happens so that you have the knowledge because you will need to tailor it to the children you're working with. Um, working with children who are engrossed in TV and media games, how do we develop new pathways and increase possibilities for self-interest and engagement? Right, so media and electronics is, I would say, the number one parent issue that we deal with. I, and um, so we have lots and lots of ideas on this. Um, and some of it can be working with it. If you, if, you know, you can't just say to a child who really enjoys these activities, no, you can't do this anymore because they're bound to be very, very upset about it. And children are very clever. They're very likely to figure out a way to work around you. And that's not what you want them to do. And so we have a number of strategies that we talk about in our um, educational sessions where you might let them use the game they're using for five minutes, 10 minutes, something. And then they have to do another activity and they can come up with what the other activity is that absolutely doesn't use electronic devices. So the strategy here is let the child have a say in what activities they're doing. They're wanting to play the electronic games because they're really engaging and they're really fun. If you're advocating that they learn some communication skills, let them choose how they're going to communicate or what games they're going to do. Spend some time looking at the first Pathways game. First Pathways game has um, 
the games by age, and it also has a section of the game at games for the diverse learner. And there it talks about some children um, really um, want to learn communication skills. So it lists out games by skill and levels and allows um, adults to look at the games that are available in a different format. So you could let them be the one to choose what are they going to do? What if the game would improve communication skills? And then they could pick to do that and then uh, go back to the electronic game and go back and forth. Hopefully I've given you some concept of what we advocate for. Me feel a lot better as a parent right now <laughs> because that is what we are doing uh, during this quarantine to try to um, you know limit the amount of um, media that my and screen time my kid is getting but he definitely yeah. um, it's on the struggle right. bus. So letting the child have a, letting them have a say letting them express what they really want to do. You, you, you know, you aren't going, if they say, well, I really want to play this electronic game all the time. No, they're not going to get to do that. But within the realm of what you think is good for them, if you give them choices or you discuss it with them, you have interactions, it's going to turn out a lot better. Love it. Um, so it's 15. Many more questions. And so I'm wondering if um, you'd be email you the remainder of the questions um, and then I can email the responses back out and maybe we'll end with one last question. Does that sound good? That sounds wonderful and I'm very, very happy. I love it when people like learning the information. I'd like to do all I can to help you learn it. I mean, it says a lot that 252 people um, 15, 16 minutes afterwards. So last question, and then we will, I will email Dr. Cameron the remainder and then um, uh, email all of these questions um, back to you all who have participated in the live webinar with her responses. Um, is this recommended for children with cerebral palsy or other birth defects that have limited verbal skills or speech delays due to the brain not fully or in a traditionally or typically developmentally developmental way. Right. It absolutely is. So we get this type of question very frequently for children with autism, children with ADHD, children with cerebral palsy. The actual process of brain development is the same for all children. They may have some genetic underpinnings where certain circuits aren't working the same way as in other children. But the process of doing a um, activity again and again so that you strengthen the circuit is the same no matter what your genetic beginning is like. So um, finding a way to get them engaged in an activity and to enjoy the activity and to want to do it again and again is important. Um, like I said, the first Pathways game has a section of the game called Games for the Diverse Learner. Um, many of these games were developed initially for kids on the autism spectrum, um, kids with ADHD. So uh, look at that for some ideas of activities you can do with kids that are interactive games between adults and children that can be adapted. In that section, we talk a lot about adapting to an individual child. Let's say you have a child who um, doesn't really like one-on-one -on -one personal interaction. How can you play the games that are interactive games that not invade their personal space, give them a little bit more room so that they find it enjoyable and they will strengthen those brain pathways. So the general process is absolutely the same for all children. Where their starting point is and what circuits they have strengthened and don't have strengthened is different 
But using the circuits and figuring out clever, creative ways to get them engaged is what you always want to be doing. Dr. Cameron, thank you again for this wonderful webinar. I can't tell you the number of um, throughout this session, um, but also thank you again for being such a wonderful partner to us in Tennessee. You have really helped us um, and contributed to both of our both our training for trainers and our ongoing education um, for leaders with Building Strong Brains Tennessee. So again, we, we are just so grateful for your partnership. And thank you all for joining us. Um, I will send out the recording um, of the webinar as well as your certificate, the .pdf version of the slides, and responses to the unanswered questions. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Bye.